Hello, friends. I'll be with you in a second. Let me <laughs> let me uh, get a little bit of sheep sheep rendering done here. All right. Good enough. Hello. Let's be official. This is Daily Art Adventure number 810. Loose acrylic fantasy. <laughs> Go. Um, so this is a painting that I did on at a church on Christmas Eve. They had really the whole day before Christmas, starting from noon till eight. They had four services. I had about 20 minutes in each service to paint and then about 20 minutes between each service to paint, so 40, 160 minutes, so uh, two hours and 20 minutes so far. And then um, the only thing I've done to it before today is um, I had star spatters up here and I have uh, glazed over all of my earlier stars with blue. More on that later. That's a just in case any of you ever have to paint a fantasy scene. Uh, or no, no, I don't mean that. In case any of you have to paint an outer space, like a cosmic outer space scene. You want your stars to be in layers, not in my opinion. You don't want them all to be white. Uh, if you want to see if one of my finished paintings, very similar to this, uh, go to my YouTube community page. Go to Dan Nelson Art Community, you know, YouTube, then click on community and you'll see. Go back a couple weeks and you'll see a, a, an outer space cosmic outer space scene that, that I'm pretty happy with so this painting is an unusual challenge hello Barbara and Mohammed good to have you on board I don't remember hearing from you before welcome and uh, the funny part to me that I'm <laughs> struggling with is uh, that other painting I mentioned I did my normal thing, which is that I finished it in oil. This painting, I wanted to keep it looser. For one thing, it's working fairly well, I would say, in acrylics, and, it, and it's quite loose, and I think I want to keep that feel. The other is I don't want to put four, five, six more hours of work into this, which is probably what would happen if I switched to oil. So what I'm trying to do here today is just finish it fairly quickly in um, in acrylics, which is not not well. Here's what's unusual about that for me. Now. Okay, a painting painting finishing acrylics, of course, is unusual in itself. But um, more than that, um, for me, the if I may call it the fantasy genre, and you see by the description there in the online, I called it fantasy slash spiritual because it's obvious. It's a Christian uh, Christmas scene. There's a real subtle cross up here in the stars, which is almost invisible now, but that will be that will be redrawn, uh, re-rendered. I still want it to be sim uh, subtle, but but not invisible. Right now, it's too close to invisible. Anyway, the, what I'm trying to say is normally when I do a f fantasy painting, it's quite realistic, you know, detailed, um, hard edges, realistic, because that's sort of the nature of most fantasy paintings, right? So this is a little bit of a hybrid. Um, I want to be fantasy-ish. Huh. having trouble with my words here today. I want it to be fantasy-like, um, but loose. So that, that's the, that's the I, I, irony. <laughs> really, I'm having trouble with my words. I, 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 that's my I, I, irony. <laughs> and uh, as, as I said, I, I painted all of this rather quickly, uh, 36 by 48 painting in about two hours, a tiny bit over two hours, as you 
if you think about it, that's probably for most of you, that, that's Holland. And, and, uh, and it's you know, intended to be a representational painting too, so it's not just some crazy, nothing wrong with crazy abstract, but it's uh, representational. Anyway, I sort of like the, the looseness of it, as I said, and, and I want to keep that, but I want to make it uh, uh, correct some of the drawing mistakes, if you will. Most specifically, the sheep, the sheep and the shepherds are the worst part of this painting. Um, I did not, when I showed up there that morning at that, at that church, I did not know what I was going to paint. I didn't know I was going to paint. I had not made up my mind. I didn't know I was going to paint uh, shepherds and sheep. Okay. Otherwise, I would have done what I what I did here in about 20, 25 minutes on on Google. I would have um, I would have printed out samples of shepherds and sheep. So I have now finally I've rectified that error I, I have in front of me uh, pictures. So contrary to the traditional third grade impression of an artist which is third grade a definition of artist is somebody who can draw anything at any time out of their head. That's that's a very, in, as I said that's about eight-year-olds that's how they think. The class artist is the one, hey, can you draw a gun? <laughs> and, the, and the girls, can you draw a pony? Can you draw a unicorn? I'm sorry, I'm sounding terribly sexist, but um, I'm reflecting the truth. Uh, little girls draw horses, generally speaking. We're speaking in generalities here. So there are great exceptions to every general, but generally speaking, little girls draw horses, and maybe cats and kittens, and uh, little boys draw guns, race cars, and creatures, and stuff like that. Nowadays, it seems to me, pretty much everybody draws manga, manga, manga. Um, what's the other word for that? Anime. Um, as I've said rudely in the past, I'll say rudely again. The first person who the, the person who invented manga, manga, anime style cartoon was a genius. The second person who copied him was mildly clever. The four billion people who have copied him since then are true halfwits. <laughs> so there, I told you it was rude. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, don't, don't copy stuff, kids. I'm talking to kids now. Don't copy other people. Make up your own. Now, I was, no doubt, I was influenced by Mad Magazine when I was a kid. I really was. But I, did, I never copied Mad Magazine. I never strove to, to do one of their cartoons. I was just influenced by it, and that's what I recommend. Now, the one, one of the really good things about, on the other hand, let me, let me be a little bit kind here for a minute. One of the uh, good things about the manga manga <laughs> craze is, uh, is that young people are, uh, those who are into manga, manga, forgive me, I don't know how to pronounce that word, I think most people say manga, but I think probably the more correct term is manga, be that as it may. Um, the kids who do, and I'm blaming it on kids mostly, the kids who do it are very serious about learning anatomy, and that's, that's commendable. That, that skill could uh, translate, transfer into other uh, usable skills. So. There, that's all I'm going to say about that. Now, let's get on to the, <laughs> the business at hand, which is trying to rescue a mildly messy painting without turning it into a tight painting. I'm using one of uh, Uncle Sixty's new brushes that he sent to me yesterday. Don't want to make the rest of you feel bad, but... <laughs> I don't know how to follow up that for that sentence. I'll just say the Mr. Kind uh, Uncle Sixty, A.K.A. Horatio, sent me a big box of art supplies. Wow, no idea. Is he with us? Well, I see a lot of people saying hi. Um, Lady Grammy, good to have you all. Mustafa, I don't remember hearing from you before. Thank you for saying hi. 
And Peachy, I don't remember hearing from you before. Oh, good. Somebody, good. You're correcting me. You did draw horses, but your favorite was trees. <laughs> good. Hello, Uncle Sixty. Good to have you. I, I, how are, um, I am. I've, I've got my bar of soap <laughs> right here. In fact, <laughs> believe it or not, Uncle, I went downstairs and looked in my closet for one of those soap dispenser dishes. You know, like in the sort of like in the camping gear. And I did not find one, so I made up my mind. Next time I go into a drugstore, I'm going to buy one of those, and I'm going to start carrying that with me uh, regularly, or keeping it with, with some of my art kits. So thank you very much. Maybe you're helping me turn over a new uh, new leaf um, where I'm, I'm more careful with my painterly hygiene. That would be a good idea. I'm not sure that's what you intended, but that might be the, the result anyway. Okay, so back to the challenge here at hand, which is, whoops, that was a mistake. The challenge, which is um, doing, again, what I call a fantasy painting uh, in, in a loose style. Because for me, now my, uh, let me rephrase that. My fa actually, my favorite um, name, description, of uh, for uh, this kind of painting, it's actually storytelling. I'm very, very comfortable with that. I'm not sure this is fantasy. I don't care if it is or not, but I do like the term storytelling, and I'm, and I feel like I'm a, at least moderately competent storyteller, not only with pictures but also with, in literature, in in that's not the right word in words anyway. Um, <laughs> every once in a while, I'll tell people I am a published author. There's a big butt coming, right? I really am. I, I, I have written a book, and I don't know how many tens of thousands of copies have been sold, but they have. And here's the rest of the story. It doesn't have my name on it. I was actually a ghostwriter. I was a ghostwriter for a Christian ministry back in the 80s. And um, this is kind of funny, too. The... So I get, I, I am acknowledged in the front of the book. I will not tell you the name of it or who, who did it because I'm, I'm almost, uh, what's the word? Well, maybe embarrassed, but no, 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 no. I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed for the person <laughs> who did it. <laughs> so I will, I don't want to slander them by reporting who it was, but it was, it was pretty funny. Thankfully, I, I didn't have a big ego, ego issue with it, but it is kind of funny. I'm a published author, have sold tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 copies of this book around the world for the last 30 years. Uh, I am listed in the, um, what do you call it, the front of the book, um, where they're thanking people. That, <laughs> my mind's drawn a blank. Whatever that's called, the acknowledgments, that's right, acknowledgments. And I'm, I'm listed as, you know, thanks to Reverend Dan Nelson. <laughs> now here's, here's, that was really funny at the time, and uh, this is why I'm not going to tell you who did it or whatever. Um, it, it, it was really obvious to me that because I was not a reverend at the time, um, I, I was not a seminary graduate, <laughs> and, and, but I was a good writer. It had been somebody else's job to go strike this book, and they were bogged down and they said, hey, do you want to take it? take a whack at it? And I said, sure. So I did, and every, frankly, everybody was blown away. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute, and uh, try not to sound like I'm so arrogant. Um, but the the uh, author was just a little bit embarrassed that, that I was a nobody. Because <laughs> what he really wanted to put on there was, you know, thanks to Dr. Dan Nelson for his, uh, you know, writing contribution or something like that. But I wasn't a doctor and that was too much of a stretch. So he stretched it just a little bit and said, Reverend Dan Nelson. Now I'm exposing myself to more of my inner history than to you than, than I am usual. I usually, I kind of play my, if you will, religious cards close to my chest. So I'm, I'm ex I, I, I've blabbed more than I, because I, I don't want people coming to my channel expecting art and then getting too much, uh, you know, of a different subject, if you know what I mean. So I'm, I'm usually pretty careful about that. But anyway, it's a funny story. And uh, 
little, I'll back up a little bit since I'm on. I've dug myself into a hole <laughs> of talking about that I'm a good writer. Uh, the next question is, and this might be instructive for, for some any young people out there. Um, uh, I am a fairly fairly competent writer. Um, I did well in those kind of classes in high school and so forth. Um, I've already mentioned that I, I grew up in a home where we, we read, we read a lot of books, read good literature, besides Mad Magazine, <laughs> which my parents did not particularly approve of. Um, we did read a lot of good stuff, um, had it read to us and read it ourselves and so forth. So I had a, developed a habit of reading. Um, but the point I want to make is that um, starting in, at age 22, um, I started, I, be, I became a pretty serious journaler. So every day, no, 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 this is an exaggeration. Most days, most days in my life for the last 40 years, I've spent some time writing, literally writing, uh, sitting down and, and, and writing. And uh, so when, when people asked me 30 years ago when they were kind of amazed because all of a sudden the artist on staff is, is the one who's now the writer, and they said, well, how'd you learn how to write? And the answer was, well, I've been a, I've journaled my whole life. So there you go. If there's any instruction at all in any, any of this, it would be that, that, um, you know, you get better at what you practice. So if you practice it well, so read good stuff and journal. That's, that's how you become a writer. If you have any aspirations of being a writer. <laughs> Anyway, that's funny. Oh, hey, I started speaking of funny stories. I started to tell you this one the other day and then left it hanging and never came back to it. Okay, so last week I had my uh, annual... Pay close attention to my words. <laughs> I had my annual uh, checkup, medical checkup, right? Um first time in, in six years, right? <laughs> okay. Like most bozo brain men, <laughs> I'm not very good at going to the doctor. I don't have any complaints, so I, I didn't go to, you know, complain about anything. I just went for my checkup. Like, we're all supposed to get checkups, aren't we? We really are. We're all supposed to get colonoscopies. Mine's coming up. Yahoo. Um, actually, won't be my first. I'm Now I'm digressing against. I had testicular cancer when I was 30 years old, so I was 35 years ago now. And following that, in the, in the aftermath of that, I had a colonoscopy. So I had a colonoscopy as a very young man. So I, already, I feel like kind of already, I feel like uh, been there, done that. Anyway, good business. Anyway, I was, I got my first physical checkup last week since I've been on, um, Medicare, okay? So that's part of the story. So those of you who are already on Medicare, you know you know what's coming, partly. Evidently, <laughs> when, when, you, when you graduate to the wonderful, I mean that seriously, when you graduate to the one, one of the few things, good things about getting old <laughs> as you get on Medicare, um, when you get your first exam as a Medicare patient, it, that, that exam is called Welcome to Medicare. Like it's an actual formula, you know, like the the national or whatever. <laughs> the National Medicare Board <laughs> sends out these forms to all the doctors, and the doctors are required to uh, have the patients fill out this form. And uh, okay, first of all, once I'm sorry, once again, I'm going to come off sounding arrogant. I didn't mean to, but let's just say thank. God, I'm in, I, I'm enjoying good health. Okay, so I'm an idiot if I think I deserve good health. Uh, I, I, you understand? I, I'm tempted to go on a tangent here. I'm, we're all, we're all foolish if we don't acknowledge that much of what we enjoy in life is a gift from somebody else. Our parents, our culture, our God, maybe, if you want to go there. Okay, so uh, I, I am a, as, as far as I know, I'm a very healthy 65 year old. So, and uh, again, so what I'm saying is like, 
the attitude there is gratitude. So I don't want it to sound ungrateful, but I am very thankful that I'm pretty healthy. All right, so the questionnaire. <laughs> would, shh, don't tell anybody. I said this, I'll deny everything. The questionnaire would be more appropriate for my 91-year-old uh, mother-in-law to fill out. <laughs> fill. Welcome to... Uh, Welcome to Medicare. Now, if you don't mind, we'd like to ask you a few questions. <laughs> Number one, are you able to read the sentence? <laughs> that, that's not true, but it's pretty close. Are, you know, were you, did you drive yourself to your appointment today? Um, are you able to drive? Are you able to take your own medications? Do you remember to take your own medications? Do you have any trouble you know, taking your medications? <laughs> on and on and on. Because obviously they're trying to find out, you know, if people are have <laughs> one foot in the grave and, and one foot in in uh, Medicare. <laughs> so they ask all these questions. <laughs> and I was just again, forgive me, I'm sounding arrogant <laughs> because I'm I enjoy good health. But I was just cracking up. I was <laughs> it was it was so funny. Oops, hang on, we're dropping all over the place. Hang on, hang on. All right, hang on. <sighs> oh my goodness, hang on, hang on, hang on. Now I have to reset my monitor. <coughs> One good fall messes up so many things. <laughs> okay. Whoops. Getting there. Yeah, mic drop. Truly, literally, mic drop. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think... Okay, I think I'm still broadcasting, even though I can't hear myself yet. Anyway. Um... What was I saying right in the middle of being so blasted arrogant about thinking, being thankful for my good health? Oh, so, well, okay, so here's the, here's the, the fun part. The very last question on the Welcome to Medicare questionnaire, it was, at, it said at the bottom of this page, <laughs> it said, draw a clock that shows 7.15. <laughs> okay, so I just want you to think about that for a minute. <laughs> I'm taking a quiz at the doctor's office, <laughs> and the very last question on the quiz is to Dan Nelson, <laughs> and it's asking him to draw a picture. <laughs> okay, three guesses where this thing went. <laughs> And the first three guesses that we used to say, three guesses, first two don't count. In other words, one guess, where did this go? Uh, and I was already kind of in a good mood. You know, I try when I have to do things like that are irritating that interrupt my day's work. You know, I say I try to make the, the best of it and have fun with whoever's, you know, working behind the desk and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, yeah, you guessed it. <laughs> they said draw a picture of a clock. <laughs> That shows 7.15. Now, I, on a, I honestly, I did not take an hour to do this. I took 10 minutes. But, yes, I, I started by drawing <laughs> a grandfather clock. Um, a good, a good grandfather clock with a big, with a pendulum and Roman numerals and all the ornate carving all, all up and down and, and so on. And then I slapped my head and said, oh, doggone it. I, I should have drawn, oh, and then I drew an old man, a de tottering old geezer staring up at the clock with his chin on his hand. So, and, I, and I didn't take a picture of it. That was my real mistake. I didn't take a picture of it. Should have. Anyway, um, <laughs> and then I thought, oh, man, they asked me to draw a picture of a clock showing 715. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I should have drawn a, I should have done a digital clock. <laughs> You know, square, 750. So that's what I did. So I drew very carefully with all the little, with all the little LED bars that, you know, that we all see in a, in a digital clock. 
Anyway, so I just thought I'd pass that on just for fun. Fun being an artist, eh? <laughs> Never ask an artist to draw a picture in a doctor's office where they're trying to find out if he's senile. <laughs> just don't. Uh, I imagine they kept it somewhere. I'm hoping that somebody got a good laugh out of it. I imagine they did. But, um... Um, <laughs> thank you, Lynn. Hey, David, is that clear line in the center on purpose? Um, yes, yes. It looks like, it looks to me like reflected like a body of water. That, that's what it's supposed to look like. Okay, I'm almost finished with these shepherd guys. And thank you very much. Uh, I should tell you, everybody, shouldn't I, that the brush from uh, Uncle Sixty is a Princeton Elite. And the one I'm using right now is a number six. And uh, so I'm using actually a watercolor brush when a, you know, a bristle brush would be the, the traditional. But I want, I just want the control. You can see I'm holding the brush wrongly. I'm doing everything, you know. Uh, by the way, somebody if with the other similar, the, the partner, I did two paintings this Christmas season, very similar to each other. I was on a, I was in a, in a mood to do these cosmic sky things. And uh, Marlene, I think it was. Marlene, I don't know if you're on right now, if you'll catch this later, but um, when I paint in this way, I don't necessarily call this uh, abstract realism, even though on this painting, maybe that's what I'm doing. Nah, nah, no, my, this is, forgive me, I'm mixing my terms. I would just call this a loose, realistic painting. Um, because I, I'm not mostly concerned with the line, shape, color, design, value, texture, that that, that as I normally am. Uh, so this is this is my normal painting is abstract realism. This is just r fantasy realism in this case. All right, I think I think my uh, shepherds are good enough. And um, and and Lady Grammy, you're saying maybe it's the vertical one. Oh, well, okay. It's this. There's. I've got this cosmic star thing up here, Christmas star, that I am, I am most certainly going to finish. All right. Let me. In case I don't know how far I'm going to get today, but I'll I'll tell you where I'm going from here. Um. um a, a, a couple of things I'm going to do. I'm going to go out to the front yard and spatter. I probably won't broadcast that that part because I just did a broadcast of that just uh, about two or three weeks ago. So if, if you want to find that broadcast, um, just go back, do a search on my channel for spattering. I'm quite positive I used the word spatter. And I, I gave a clinic, if you will, on how to spatter just a couple weeks ago. So I don't, I don't expect to have to do that again uh, so soon. But I will, a spattering in, in acrylics is very easy because uh, the painting, the paint dries so quickly. That's the key. When you spatter, you want everything to be dry so you can spatter and wipe it off if it doesn't turn out well, which is likely that it won't. I, do you understand when you, when you, when you tackle a spattering project, you are going to assume that your first two, three, four, or half or dozen uh, attempts will not be very successful. See, so then you'll wipe it off. You spatter, say, yeah, that didn't work very good. You spatter again, now that's a little better, but no, it's bad over here, so you wipe it off. Very easy in, uh, in acrylics because it dries so quickly. Much, you know, much more of a challenge with oils because uh, you have to wait a day or two or whatever, depending what kind of medium you've used. You have to wait a week sometimes uh, for the uh, the painting to be dry. Okay, so that's that's the key magic formula for doing a good spatter is make sure that uh, everything's dry, and then you can you then you have multiple chances. Make sense? Again, I'm just 
just messing around here um the church that i did this for i the name of it is crossroads fellowship and um I've been involved with that church for over 30 years. We don't go there, but I've done artwork for them for over 30 years. And they have literally scores of my paintings. Scores? Yeah, very possibly over 40. A score is 20, two scores, yeah. So very, very possibly over 40 of my paintings. And this is, again, over a period of literally of decades. Uh, they had me come on, on special occasions and so forth. Um, and part of the reason I'm, I'm doing this one in the style that I'm doing it in is because it's a little bit commensurate with the, uh, my other, much of my other work that is there. Not that that's really that important, but they paid me fairly. They paid me well for this job, and uh, so I want to give them a, a decent painting. That's the reason I'm finishing it. And um, I don't want them to be surprised, you know, when, I, when it shows up, I go, oh, that's great, instead of going, oh, what's that? All right, I think I'm done with the shepherds, at least for now, or should I reserve the right to you know, change anything? So they're, they're accurate enough. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. So this guy here, he looks like a goonberry, whatever a goonberry is. His, his eyes are too dark and his mustache is too dark. A little bit Groucho Marx-ish, you know? Same thing here, like, so I'm just pushing back the, the contrast here. That, that makes a big difference. All right. Now, the part of this painting that I'm really looking forward to doing is, uh, is um, these angels. Um, I did angels, ironically, I did angels in both paintings. So again, they're, they're quite similar, the two paintings that I did. Again, you can find the other one on my community page. Oh, I forgot to finish. After spattering, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up the airbrush again. So I'll be doing airbrushing here and anywhere else I feel like it. In this case, since this painting is in um, acrylics, um, airbrushing is is uh, no brainer, shall we say? It's 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 real easy. It's like acrylics. Um, the airbrush's native language is acrylics, if you will. Um, a couple of weeks ago, though, when I was finishing the other painting uh, I, that I finished, that, similar to this one, but I finished in oil. Um, I did, uh, I did finish that one in airbrush with oils. So somebody commented, I think it might have been uncle said, I didn't know you could airbrush oils. Certainly you can, I just, just thinned them down with medium and Gamsol, whatever. Um, think about it, um, automotive airbrush painters have been have been um, have been using uh, oil-based paint in their airbrush on automotive stuff for, for decades so not not really that unusual can be done now I don't know if you can see that you can barely see Indeed, I could use that's a, I could use salt for effect. That would be that would be fun. I'll, I'll consider that, um, David, up here in the sky, right? Um, anyway, I was going to say I don't know if you can see. There's real faintly there's a cross up here. Let me tell you, and you can go back and actually watch me paint this in a in a church setting if if you care to. Um, Christmas Eve, so just go back to Christmas Eve. Um, and I had, again, about 20 minutes in each service. So I'll tell you what I did. The first service, I did this star and a, a cosmic starry night. And then the, 
the hint of an arc, like the globe, the earth down here in a big arc. That was first service. Second service, I, I wiped out that globe and turned it into a sunset and uh, added the angels. Third service, I did the shepherds and the... Sh no, no, I'm missing up here. Anyway. Oh, I did, the sh I did the angels in the first service. That's right. So first service, I did stars, stars, star, and angels. Second service, I did sunset and shepherds. Third service, I did Joseph, Mary, baby, and the hidden angel. And the fourth service, I added a cross up here, which is because of my recent glaze. It's become even more invisible. But I want it to be quite, uh, quite subtle, even when I'm finished. But not as subtle as, as it is right now. I don't know if you guys can even see it. I guess you can. Hey, Susan, thank you for remembering. And uh, I'm doing something now that I thought about doing. I'm putting herald trumpets, not to be confused with hark the herald angels sing. This is, <laughs> um, I, it's just, as you can see, I'm, in, I'm in calling on, employing, employing a whole bunch of traditional, traditional religious Christmas images. Um, there is no, there is no theological or biblical uh, evidence that angels play trumpets. None. <laughs> That's just a tradition. But okay. In fact, there is no. As some of you might find this surprising. Uh, there's actually no theological or biblical evidence that angels have wings. Okay, that is simply to, the cherubim, which is a different creature in the Bible. The cherubims, but cherubim is plural. Cherubim. Uh, have wings, but angels, uh, when they show up in the Old Testament, say, and the New Testament, think about it. Um, um, Gabriel, when he showed up to Mary, he didn't. He didn't have wings. He just showed up looking like a man, usually in bright clothing. Anyway, so there is no technically no evidence that angels literally have wings. But <laughs> I've had to slap down the theological side of myself. <laughs> It, many times over the years because I realized that if I didn't put wings on them, 90% of the congregation uh, wouldn't know uh, what they were. Wouldn't, they'd say, why are those men? <laughs> why are those, why the, oh no, they would say, why are those women? Because they're wearing long robes. They would say, also, of course, you know, angels are n n neither male nor female, but m in, in the Bible more often portrayed as male. Uh, but in, in our traditional, you know, uh, uh, often portrayed as female. Um, <laughs> again, all of these are just what I'm doing in, such, in a thing like this. Certainly with the cross, with the star, with the angels, with the sh everything. The sh everything is tap tapping into, uh, just tapping into the traditional symbols. So that's, it's part of our job, I would say. It's a reasonable part of our job as artists. To understand the, uh, you know, the the uh, symbolic language of our audience. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm I'm not going to quibble <laughs> over whether angels really have wings. I'm going to give them wings because that's what everybody thinks. That's all right. Of course, and they're really a lot more dramatic and attractive with wings than they would be just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> men <laughs> or women floating in the air would be a little bit, uh, even to me, would be a little bit weird. Um, I will, I will throw out. Uh, so we're we're getting a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more <laughs> scripture here in this in this broadcast than some of you are used to. That's all right. Don't freak out. I'm not going to, uh, as far as I know. If I decide to turn over in a new direction in my broadcast, I'll announce it before I do. This is not that announcement. Um. <laughs> um Let's do some sky holes up here in this. I was going to say something else. Oh yeah, angels. That's right. So there is a, there is another theme, another subject um, that I'm playing around with in this, which is to me is the fun part of the funnest. As far again, as far as symbols go, this is the funnest part of this this particular painting. All right. So there's a a, a verse in the New Testament where I think it's the Apostle Paul. He says to his readers. He said, um, um, be careful to, to practice hospitality with one another. You know, 
be friendly, have people in your home, feed the stranger, and so on and so on and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a big subject, um, and I'm not going to get into it here, but he says hospitality is a good thing is basically what he says. And then he adds, he said, after all, simply by being hospitable, uh, some people have served angels without knowing it. Now, it's almost certainly that in that ref that the Apostle Paul, being a good Jew, um, he's referring to the Jewish scripture, and there was at least one, no two, episodes in the Old Testament where um, people literally served angels a meal without knowing it was an angel. Number one is uh, Gideon, um, I believe. Um, number two is Abraham, and it seems to me I'm missing a couple. Okay, so I, forgive me, I did not do a Bible study before I started this broadcast <laughs> to make sure I'm getting this right. But the, in more than one occasion in the Old Testament, um, people served, literally served angels, not knowing they were angels, and then, and then suddenly, the, you know, the angels manifest, and they go, ah! Good stories. And... Uh, so that's probably what the Apostle Paul is primarily referring to, although in, he might also be saying that, that, that in, in his hearing or in his lifetime, he might be saying that even, so to speak, in our day, he would say, even in our day, some people have served angels without knowing it. So, and clearly he says that's a possibility, according to the Apostle Paul. Otherwise, his, his injunction is meaningless. He says... Be nice to each other, serve each other, be generous, have people in your home, serve them, because some people have actually served angels doing this. So it, it seems to me he's saying, and it might happen to you too. All right, so are you with me so far? So that's, again, that's pretty, that's pretty standard, you know, uh, Christian tradition that uh, angels can, can sometimes manifest among us without us even realizing it. All right, so I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> If I'm triggering you, I have my deepest apologies, and you just hang up, go away, come back another day when we don't get into any scripture or anything. <laughs> yeah, and I am saying that with a little bit of a smirk, just a little bit, just a very, very, very tiny smirk, though. Not that anyone would notice. Anyway, <laughs> here's, the, here's, here's a fun thought. Um, if it's possible that people could uh, serve angels without realizing that they were angels, then it, it's a small, th then you could say in a sense that the angels show up uh, in disguise. Is that fair enough? Not in the skies, no, no, in disguise. They, they show up in, it, the Apostle Paul is clearly saying, they show up and, and people don't realize that they're angels. So it's a small step from that. Now, there's, I'm going somewhere here. Bear with me. There's a reason I'm saying all this, because it has to do with the painting. Uh, the, it's a the small step from saying angels can show up in disguise. Small step from that to saying, hey, maybe sometimes angels, I'm going to change the language a little bit just to make it kind of a fun point. Could angels ever come in camouflage? <laughs> I'm not starting some new church, so you can relax and don't worry. And I would never claim that this is what happens. It's just, it's the fun of being a storyteller. Like, if, if this would make a delightful, you know, novel about angels showing up in disguise. So there's one thing for an angel to show up looking like a man because he's disguised to not look like an angel. What's to keep an angel from showing up like a dog or a sheep? or a tree, or a hill, or a cloud. Ba, 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 ba. So, what are we getting to here? Here's, here's the, the, so I, this was really, really was in my mind while I was doing this. These are angels in disguise. Is this a sunset? Well, clearly this is an angel right here. And then that one and that one are, and that one, and, but wait a minute, some of these, it just, these could just be clouds. Are you with me? So that's, that's the fun I'm having here. And it, it is, again, just for me, just mostly just fun. And then finally, over here in the corner, I have, in fact, an, a, a big, one of these guys has landed. He, by the way, he's about 12 feet tall. And um, he's got a, a trumpet, and he's just standing there. And 
I even asked my grandchildren, I said, do Mary and Joseph know that he's here? And they, they all said, no, that's exactly right. That's, he's invisible. That's why he's, he's dark. He's semi-transparent. In fact, up here, am I still on, on camera? Almost up here. Okay, so that looks like that looks like one. That looks like, that's the game I'm playing here. It's like, is that an angel? I don't know. Maybe, maybe that one. That uh, what about that? I don't know. So that's is, the, is this an angel right here? Could be. That's the game I'm playing. Do you understand? So I'm just having fun visually as an artist. I'm having fun as a as a storyteller, artist. Um, I want to make what if I'm going to do storytelling paintings, then. Dog on it. <laughs> I want them to be fun. I want them to be good stories. Fair enough. So that's that's what I'm doing here. It's like, oh. So in fact, I, I might even push this particular angel. I might do a glaze on top of him and push him back even a little more than he already is. Finally, I'm going to do some normal two-handed painting here now. Um, and then, finally, in this painting, not only are the angels uh, in disguise, it's kind of hard to tell what's an angel and what's not. That's, that's, I'd like to hit that balance. Then I've got this cross. That, in fact, you see this dark space right there? This is part of the base of the cross. And, and again, I want that to be subtle as well. It would, in fact, if I can hit my mark where I'd like to go, I would like about... 15 or 20 percent of the general population, the people who look at this painting hanging on the wall, I'd like about 15 or 20 percent of them to completely miss this cross and not see it at all. And I would like 40, 30 percent to miss these as angels. We've talked about this quite a bit. Um, this principle has nothing to do with spirituality. This principle has to do with um, visuality, um, you do not want to create paintings for or company logos. Again, we've, we've talk, I've talked about this quite a bit. You do not want to design a corporate logo that everybody gets. Uh, you do, in fact, you do not want to do a painting that everybody uh, gets. And that sounds very counterintuitive. Like, yeah, I do. No, you don't. I'm going to explain why, and forgive me, this is a review for some of you. Um, let me explain why you do not want to paint a paintings that everybody, quote unquote, gets. And what do I mean by gets? Well, I just happen to have a recent painting over here waiting to go downstairs, but it's not there yet. I'll pull it up just for a minute. You, many of you, you saw me do this painting. Um, hang on. You saw me do this painting a couple weeks ago, finished it. I actually did a tiny touch on it just today. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening here that is some stuff that 90% of the viewers will not get, and that's fine with me. Now, I don't generally want to leave 90% in the dark, but like here was the most obvious thing. This is a painting. It was a white road, white cars, white building, white clouds, everything. The name of this painting is plain vanilla, in parentheses, ice cream plant, because this is an ice cream plant, okay, in New Bern, North Carolina. And everything was white. The road was white. The cars were white. The building is all white and the sky was white, okay? And uh, I talk about that quite a bit when I'm painting. And, and part of this is a clinic about how to paint white stuff. Now, I don't expect most people to say, oh, I get it, everything's white. I expect 20% of the viewing, if I call it plain vanilla, I expect 20% of the population to go, I get it, everything's white. Um, and then there's just more and more subtleties everywhere. Um, you know, like there's there's a significant percent of the population that won't even see literally this blush of orange up here and this blush of pink and this blue. They literally won't see it, and that's okay with me. Um, let me explain now. Let me and I get off the subject. Why do I want a significant percent of the population to quote unquote not get my paintings? Here's why. If you create paintings or a corporate logo or whatever a visual thing. That, that everybody can get, uh, then you're creating stupid art. Here, here's why. There's a certain percent of the population, this is no shame on them. Uh, we're all good at different things. But there's a certain percentage of the population 
that is very visually obtuse. They just don't see stuff. They don't notice. But here's the key thing. They don't care that they don't notice. All right? And they're perfectly happy going through life, not paying really any attention to beautiful sunsets, really worth mentioning. Um, they, 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 they will not stop and stare at a leaf or a caterpillar or a broken twig or a rock. They just won't do it. Uh, uh, they can't tell the difference between a, a, a snapshot that they took with their iPhone and, and a photograph that somebody took for, for National Geographic. They, they can't really tell the difference and they don't really care. Does that make sense? So if you try to do a painting that quote unquote everybody gets, you have to make it so blunt, obtuse, that you're boring then everybody who does care. There you go. Did you catch that? If you make a painting that everybody gets, then you're boring 60, 70, 80 percent of the population who cares about visual things. There's a certain percentage of the population, no matter what you do, they're not going to care about visual stuff. So keep that in mind. You want a certain percentage of the population to be left out in the dark. And uh, this, by the way, I, I keep mentioning corporate logos. I've talked about this several times. I learned this lesson you know, very much and very much the hard way over the decades of being a, uh, occasional uh, graphic designer. Here's the funny part. Very often, one of the most visually obtuse, if I can use that word, one of the most visually obtuse people in the whole corporation is the man or woman, it, more often the man, right, is the man in the corner office, is the chairman, CEO, whatever, CFO would be worse than that probably. Um, so that, that's a really interesting problem. In fact, and again, I'm getting off topic now. I'm not talking about logos. But the reason, like if, if uh, any major corporation like Pepsi or, you know, whatever, uh, Northwest Airlines, I've talked about their logo before. Um, if they want to design a new logo, um, it's going to cost them probably a quarter of a million dollars. Here's, do you know why it's going to cost them a quarter million dollars? Because that's how much it costs to convince for, I'm going to be really mean here for a minute. That's how much it's going to cost to convince Mr. Bozo in the corner office that it's a good logo. See, those artists, they could, they could produce a killer logo for 200 bucks. <laughs> they really could. But Mr. I'm being really harsh, forgive me. The man in the corner office is not convinced. And he, he's very often one of the most visually obtuse. Why? Why? Because he's good at other things. He's good at organizing and administrating and inspiring followers and inventing th oh, no, not inventing he'd be a good visual person um, anyways that makes sense so very often the, the the business skills and visual acuity if I can use that word are are mutually exclusive not always not always but very often they are mutually exclusive um, gift sets gift mixes so very often the the, the the hardest person to convince. And this is true with advertising uh, as well. Um, this is why, you know, a good commercial, a good commercial uh, campaign um, often costs so much money is because they have to convince the guy who's actually terrible at advertising in the corner office that this, in fact, is a good ad. Um, again, I'm still on a tangent. So this is, I don't know, rant number or whatever, right? Um, I've told my kids that anytime you see a commercial on TV that's really, really, really good, which usually means really funny, do you see a commercial on TV that's really funny? Do you know how that happened? It's somehow, somehow the ad agency, the, everything's done by an ad agency, right? Somehow the ad agency managed to convince the CEO that their ideas were better than his. <laughs> which is hard to do because rich people think they're good at everything. That's why they're rich. Woo! Woo, sizzle. We just got into another deep subject. <laughs> deep but true. Rich people think they're good at everything. They think that's why they're rich, because they're good at everything. Um, all right. And I am, I am not uh, one who, it, like, I don't have a Marxist attitude. I'm not angry. I don't hate rich people. In fact, <laughs> rich people are my clients, right? I want rich people to get richer, because that's who buys paintings. And if you're an artist, you do too. Be that as it may, my, my job is to serve people, all people, with my art, whether they're rich or not. But um, that is one of the downsides of being wealthy, is wealthy people, by and large, 
think that they are wealthy because they made good decisions where other people made stupid ones. And of course, very often that's true. But what, what it turns out, I mean, why am I a good artist? Why am I, Dan Nelson, why am I a good artist? I could stand up here and say, well, it's because I worked so hard. You can't imagine how hard I worked. A lot of people have made comments over the years about, wow, you're the hard, hardworking artist, blah, 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 blah. Right? And if I start buying that crap <laughs> and I start thinking, yeah, I'm a good artist because I worked so hard. Well, some of you know better. Some of you know better. And by the way, there's some people, <laughs> Mark Carter being the most exceptional, uh, prominent that I know of, who thinks anybody can become an artist. Well, yeah, that's semantics. That is not true. But anyway, and everybody knows it, really. <laughs> um, why am I a good artist? Uh, because I won the, uh, what's the word, the, what's the expression? I won the DNA, uh, uh, you know, slot machine. I, I, I lucked out with the parents that I had and a thousand, thousand other things. I'm a good artist partly because in third grade, my poster won second place in a national safety poster contest. Some of you have heard that funny story. I now question how national it actually was, but that be that as it may, that it was AAA, and they, they said I won second place at national at age eight. So again, that part of the reason I'm an artist is I got, this is uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Part of the reason I'm an artist is because I got encouragement along the way. Right? That's Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, outliers. Um, and a thousand other things. So, um, why are rich people rich? Because just like I was born with an ability to do art and then I worked at it, they were born with an ability to make money and they worked at it. Same thing. Like, here's, I know I'm ranting here. I hope somebody finds this entertaining, if not instructive. Um, I was a pretty good high school distance runner, you know, like in my high school, medium-sized high school, a couple thousand kids in my high school. Um, I was the most valuable player, so to speak, for track, distance, and, and cross country my senior year, okay? I didn't set any school records, but I was the best that year. I went to college on a small scholarship. Actually, let me correct that. I did go on a small scholarship, not for athletics, but I got offered a small scholarship, that's what I should say, from another school to come and run. So not a great runner, but a pretty okay middle of the road. Do you understand? When I was a young person, I actually suffered under the delusion for far too long that I was a good runner because I had worked my buns off. Because guess what? I had pretty much every high school runner if they're the best runner in their high school, that almost certainly means that's because they trained harder than everybody else. That is true. You with me so far? But I made, I went, took the next step and said, oh, I'm the best or I'm as good as I am. I went on after college. I had a, you know, a good middle of the road, small college track career. And um, I went on to coach track for 10 years after that high school and cross high school and middle school girls and boys in various states um, but I, I made the mistake early in life of thinking well I'm good because I've worked hard looking back as an old man now who <laughs> runs like an old man I now realize oh wait that's not really true I was a good runner sure I did work hard I did work hard not as hard as some people that's why I wasn't as good but really what did I have I had the physique, I had the heart, I had the, there were a thousand things in my life that, that converged, that came together to give me a leg up, so to speak, as a runner. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? Um, we are all what we are, not because of our own dint of determination. <laughs> we're not all what we are because we've worked so hard. Anyway, I'm, in, I'm encouraging to myself, I'm encouraging more gratitude, less arrogance. More thankfulness, less, less, uh, and the, the people who are not so blessed are very keenly aware of this. Like when I look, when I hang out with rich people and uh, I like, I'll use an example, like uh, Dave Ramsey, who I think teaches very good principles for finances. And, I, and I'm not condemning him, but why is Dave Ramsey good with money? Is, I mean, 
he went bankrupt. Blah, he's got his story. But no, it's a God-given gift. Why is he good with money? Because call it what you will, because the cosmos conspired to give him those gifts. Um, and I, partly I want you guys to know that I recognize that of myself. Do I work hard as an artist? Yeah, I think most of you would say, yeah, you do work hard. I do, but am I arrogant? Hey, I got this way because I worked hard. I, I hope not, man, I really hope not. No, I don't think so. I'm good because I was given a whole bunch of advantages. And, and every one of us is only responsible to be what we were created to be or what we evolved to be. <laughs> I don't have a dog in that fight. You can go either way you want with that one. Um, so you're not supposed to be me and I'm not supposed to be you. We're just all supposed to be the best version of ourselves that we can be. And I, that sounds like me. Sounds like Oprah now, doesn't it? Okay. <laughs> all right. I'm not sure if that was a rant or not, but I sure talked a long time, didn't I? And you guys are chatting up a storm over there and I'm not paying any attention. Hang on, I'm almost done here with the, the current um, painting phase. I'm adding, I've added in the last several minutes quite a bit of color to the uh, middle ground and a little bit of distance ground. I think it looks quite a bit better than it was before this, it was just too dark. Um, now the next question, do I, so do I want to do anything here? Almost not. I'm going to leave that for right now because I don't, I don't feel talking about the, the crutch, the crash, <laughs> spelled crutch, the uh, manger scene, the traditional manger scene. I feel like it's mostly working. It's very loose. I might just leave it that way. Um, that's too much. Let's push that back while it's still wet. All right, I'll, I'll let you watch me do. <laughs> Isn't that nice of me? I'll let you watch me do. <laughs> One more thing. Um, I'm going to uh, mask off this, uh, the cross up here in the sky before I before I take it down to the uh, front yard. It's dark outside here. Now it's 5.50 p.m. in January, so it's already dark out there and I've been thinking about this a little bit and I've decided yeah I think the thing to do up here with this with this cross is to um, <laughs> hang on hang on hang on it's I, I can't I can hardly see it myself so and by the way you know you're getting a terrible glare up here from this light but then when I turn that off <laughs> you get clear from the other one. So let's see how long the the arms are on this. Let's say six inches. Okay. So I'm I'm masking the cross so that when I go down to the front yard in a few minutes and um, spatter with white. I'll spatter a little bit with the tape here. Then I'll take the tape off and spatter a little bit more. And if I want to be consistent with my own advice, I will actually wait until the first spatter dries before I do the second, right? Which is, I probably do want to be consistent with my own advice. So. Okay, six inches. I want this, I want the cross uh, to be quite, and 
to, quite, to be quite subtle. give some of you a heart attack right now. The airbrushers do that kind of stuff all the time. So that wasn't quite as scary as it as it looked. Again, the, the, the airbrush skill here is to press hard enough to get through the tape, but not so hard that you leave a line in the, in the paint. So theoretically, then it should be six inches up from there. Yeah. Hey, here's a, here's a good, here's a good sideline topic here for, for a second. Um, Right, so right under that dot. Um, you all have heard about the golden mean, right? The golden mean is a ratio of Fibonacci numbers, blah, blah, blah. You can Google it and, and real quickly find all kinds of stuff about the golden mean. And it, it appears to show up in amazing places in nature. And in art, and in classical art, Renaissance art, um, hang on, let me make sure that's truly vertical. And there is, uh, there's some people that ascribe nearly magical or supernatural uh, attributes to this magical mystery number of the golden mean. Um, the golden mean is it's an it's an ironic number, so it's like pi, I believe. So it goes on forever. But the the short version of it, like pi, is six point one eight. Six point one eight to one. One to it's a ratio here. One to six point one eight. Okay, and the, and the digits go on forever after that. Um, uh oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This might not be coming out right. Because if I, if this is supposed to be, there's a reason I'm mentioning that right now. Just hang on just a second. Let's make sure I'm not screwing up. I am screwing up. Isn't that interesting? I see what I did. This is not wide enough. Okay, hang on, bear with me. Let's do some more measuring. Um, there's a reason I'm mentioning the, the uh, golden mean. And, and there is some debate. I had, personally, I had a fun, hot debate, in good natured, with, uh, with a, um, David Dunlop several years ago. We were on a trip together painting in France. It makes me sound like a big hot shot, doesn't it? Be that as it may. We were painting together in France. Okay, generous eighth of an inch. And the subject of the of the golden mean came up, and he is he is a poo pooer of the golden mean. <laughs> okay, so he's one. He's a very very smarty smarty pants academic scientific kind of guy. Lots of research. I I I like him a lot. We had a great time together, and I see him every year at Art of the Carolinas. And get to spend time when we can. Anyway, a lot of fun. But he's he says, nah, there's nothing to that. All those people who say that. Not the, not the supernatural thing, but his, he was saying that there is no evidence that uh, the golden mean is any more of a pleasant ratio than any other ratio. And he cited a study. He said studies were done where people, focus groups, were brought into a room, showed, shown a whole bunch of rectangles and asked to um, identify which ones were more or less pleasing. And according to David Dunlop, there's absolutely no correlation between 
uh, the ratio of the rectangles and the golden mean did not bubble to the top as the most pleasing of shapes. Okay, that's, so that's one school of thought. As you can maybe imagine, I think he's wrong. Now this is, this is not a, this is not a, a hill that I would die on. <laughs> but I think, I think he's wrong. And I think I, under, I think I see the flaw in the, uh, in the study. Now this, this, this can really help some of you artists. We've never talked about this. I've never talked about this on a broadcast before. So this is da -da 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 -da, new information. I think the flaw, the study that David mentioned, I've never seen it, I just heard about it. I think it was flawed. And he, I think I can tell you the flaw. The flaw was that they brought people in and showed them neutral or naked, if you will, rectangles. Just plain, you know, geometric shapes on a board. And I concur that with no other parameters, I can, I can easily imagine that a golden mean is no more exciting than any other uh, ratio. But, you hear big butt coming, right? And there's a reason I'm talking about this. Um, I don't think that's correct. I think there, for, for many particular things in the world, um, the golden mean is a far sight more, to use old country language, countrified language, uh, the golden mean is a far sight more uh, advantage, better than not golden mean. Um, do I have a T-square up here? I used to. I think I took it downstairs. Okay, time to buy another T-square. Uh, is anybody still listening? <laughs> All right. I have a couple stories to tell you. So most people in the Western world are quite familiar with the traditional Latin cross, okay? It has a name. It's called the Latin cross. It's the, it's the traditional Jesus cross. Are you with me? And um, everybody's seen it. And I contend that there is a right, hang on, five and three quarters. Oh my goodness, I'm way off. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be here a while. I might, I might give you guys a break while I get all this straightened out. And, but I'm going with three inches is the right width. So I've gotta add um, that much over here. Okay, hang on just a second, I'll get back to it in a minute. There is a correct ratio, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, <laughs> there is a correct ratio for the Latin cross. You guessed it, it is the golden mean. Um, and my proof for that is it, it, it absurdly non-scientific. Okay, so I'm not claiming that I've like done tons of research. I just think everybody intuitively knows it and I'm gonna give you some stories to that effect. Um, you know when you're driving down the highway or driving through the city and you pass a Christian church, many, many times that Christian church will have a cross uh, on the outside of their building, either on the steeple or on the facade of their building or in the window or something like that. Right? You with me? And um, if, and I've, I, I've thought this since childhood, it, way before I knew anything about the golden mean, I'm sitting there in my, in this case, in my dad's Baptist church in Michigan or Ohio. I was subjected to, you know, crosses. And as a kid, I went, that one's not right. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm telling you, this is true. I remember thinking, uh-uh, that one's not right. That cross is ugly. That is exactly what I thought. And I still think it. So very subjective, I know. This is not a proof but I think most people would, would concur. If the cross, and the, the mistake that, you know, what happens is, it, like in a, in a non-liturgical church is, you know, Billy Bob, the, 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 one of the carpenters in the church, was asked to build, I'm making this up, you understand? 
he was asked to build a church across to go in front of the church. And Billy Bob not only doesn't know anything about the golden mean, he, he is not familiar with the Latin cross or the tradition and so on and so forth. So he just builds a beautiful, you know, walnut, <laughs> cherry, redwood cross to go on the wall. And everybody goes, yay, we got a cross on the wall. And me, little Dan Nelson, was going, boo. <laughs> Sorry, Billy Bob. You got her wrong, buddy. <laughs> because it, the most common thing is it would be too squatty. It would be too wide and not tall enough. Does anybody here have that same experience? Some of you are going to go, oh, God, I thought that same thing my whole life. Just nobody ever told me. Uh, so that, that's one thing. Here's another and this, this is also related to like liturgical themes, if you will. Sorry, I'm being hitting on so many <laughs> liturgical themes today. Not, not, not on purpose. Um, several years ago, uh, a church, because I'm an artist, they had designed liturgical banners to hang uh, on the walls of their church. And they had, somebody in their church had designed all these different, you know, so they had crosses and a dove and a lion and a, you name it, you know, all the, all the icons on these beautiful banners, beautifully colored. They hadn't made them yet. They had just laid them out on computer or on paper. And, uh, and uh, the pastor of the church said, hey, would you mind taking a look at these and, you know, give, give me your input because you're a good artist. And I took one look and went, ah! <laughs> I took one glance and went, oh, ouch! And, and again, you, you can guess what, what, what was wrong with it. Um... Okay, so I need to take the scant quarter of an inch off this. I'm going to get this right yet, I promise. So I simply took, I think I did, this was in the early days of computer, but yeah, I believe I had a computer back then. This was late 90s, mid 90s, maybe late. Anyway, um, I just simply took their designs, and guess what I did? I measured, and I multiplied, and I turned the banners into the golden mean. Now that was the first thing I did. I might have done more to them after that, but that, that's all I did right at first. And I showed them to the, this said pastor who had asked me to take a look at their banners. And his eyebrows went up and his corners of his mouth went up and he smiled and said, doggone it, that's a lot better. <laughs> uh, so I think, uh, I think the golden mean actually is, in, in spite of some of the research to the contrary, because I think the research is faulty, um, I think it's a helpful thing for artists. Uh, in the course of my career, I've done many, how many? Uh, less than 50, more than 20, so many, many paintings. Uh, if I have to stretch a canvas, arbitrary, you know, any size whatsoever, I almost always will make it a golden mean. Now, I can't guarantee that that, that guarantee that that makes it a better painting, but I can guarantee that it's a pleasant shape. And um, if you have to make a cross for your church, for, <laughs> for God's sake, <laughs> That's a joke. For God's sake, make sure it's the golden mean. It, likewise, you have to make a banner. If you have to design a flag for any purpose whatsoever, make it a golden mean. And the most common mistake is people will make it um, too, uh, too squatty. I, now, the, I have, the next question I have, oh, I don't have, I don't have a phone available. Uh, I wanna talk, I wanna ask about the, the current television screen, which is nine by 16. Um, that's not quite the golden mean, because 10 by 16 and a bit would be golden mean. So the, the t TVs are, sl I'm sure somebody thought about it when they did it. I'm quite sure somebody actually gave it some thought, but they didn't ask me. I would have said, okay, you're so close to the golden mean. Why don't you, just in case, why don't you go ahead and go all the way and uh, make it that way. Make it golden mean on purpose. Uh, so some of you, and so... There's, a, again, you can look yourself, you read yourself silly on this subject. And some of it you might indeed think it is completely silly. Uh, but there's enough evidence that makes, should make you a little suspicious. Like, I don't know, there might be something to this. I don't mean like I'm suggesting, recommending you go conspiratorial theory on this at all. But uh, when it comes to a cross, I'm quite positive that uh, if you want your cross, it's a Latin cross, and if you want it to look appropriate and it has nothing to do with historicity of you know what kind of crosses Jesus 
crucified on. It has nothing to do with the literalness. It just has to do with the visual tradition and what, what appeals to, what seems to be uh, um, pleasing to the human eye. Oh, so you can ask me, well, is this, is this a gold mean? The answer is no, because my, my cross is trailing off. <laughs> it, you know, so no, I'm not even trying to capture it. But yes, if it, it would be about there. Are you with me? Right, probably right about there. Whereas the wrong cross in your local uh, non-Catholic church, they, they, they might have something like that. Do you see how squatty? It's just not pleasant. This is pleasant, in my opinion. And my opinion might be wrong on this, in this regard. But don't disregard it too quickly, because I think it, it probably is not wrong. Oh, make a stencil. I could make a stencil. Well, I, I just made a stencil with tape, didn't I? <laughs> I'm kidding. I didn't really, because it's, it's a one use stencil if it is, isn't it? Now I've got a, a completely goofy thing happening in this painting. I hope you understand that. And in, in that I have angels coming from a star, right? You, you know, that's goofy. That's as, that's as goofy as unicorns. Angels do not come from stars. And certainly the traditional Christmas story, <laughs> the angels and the, the angel and the stars have nothing to do with, with each other in the traditional Christmas story. Okay, so this is a this is a con admitted mashup of mashup of symbols, mashup of icons, and not being in the least bit literal here. This is just fun. That's all. Oh my goodness! Look what I just did. Woo! Wow! I just put a big white smudge on there. Okay, so I hope I'm not either bothering anybody or kidding anybody. There, there, there's no, <laughs> there's no <laughs> historical correlation between the angels and the star. It's just fun. It's just fun visual stuff. That's all it is. Just fun Christmas visual, okay? It's okay to have fun, even with religious stuff, in my opinion. Nearly ready to uh, go downstairs and do some spattering. Okay, so let me review again real quick. Then I know you guys have been leaving a lot of good chats, and I'm ignoring them all, venting away, <laughs> ranting away, <laughs> and ignoring your delightful chats. Forgive me. Um, uh, So I'm going to spatter. Again, the concept is the painting has to be dry because you don't just trust that you're going to get the spatter right. You do it several times till you get it just perfect. And uh, I'm going to have to do that twice because I'm going to spatter once with the tape in place. So I get a little bit of a silhouette. And then, um, then I'll take the tape off, wait till it's dry, I'll take the tape off and spatter again so that I get some white stars in front of the uh, in front of the cross. Now let me let me review. I said earlier today that I would talk about the, one of the tricks for doing a cosmic. In case you ever ha have to do a cosmic outer space painting, you know, a Hubble telescope kind of painting. Um, one of the key ing ingredients is so stars are different size, they're different color, and there's a dimensionality. So all the stars that were, are on here right now, they were white not long ago, and then I did blue over all of them. So all the stars on the sky right now are blue. So the new ones that I do are going to be white, and if I really want to, you know, go for it, I will glaze all of those and then do it again. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm going to do that. I don't know if I'm going to go get that deep into it. I might. I might not. I haven't decided yet. 
but that, that dimensionality. So you do stars, glaze, stars, glaze, stars again. And you do some different color, um, like orange, green, blue, red, pink, yellow stars. Just a few, okay? That is, again, if you want to make it look like a really groovy, cool, cosmic uh, starscape. And then, of course, I mean, most of you probably are not going to go out and buy an airbrush. Although, commercial time, hang on. I have a, I have a little airbrush over here. Just to give you some idea, um, airbrushes have come way down in, in cost. Uh, I mean, I have really a really expensive airbrush over there, but I don't even need to use it. This is distributed, I think, by Jerry's little compressor and uh, cheap air. I even might have, I think I bought this at Harbor Freight. You know, yeah, ch cheap, cheap, cheap. Um, but it does the job. This is not an airbrush. This is an air gun. This is like an automotive. It's like a king size airbrush. This is what, not what I will use. But I, they, I have a cheap airbrush over here. So for less than I don't know, less than one hundred and fifty dollars, I think you can get a, a, satisfactory, airbrush, brush and. Compressor. Um, there's you know made in China by poor, political, prisoners. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm afraid I'm right. Anyway, made in dirt cheap in China, knockoffs, copies of good things that real engineers designed. <laughs> oh boy. All right, let me, let me take a quick glance at some. I'm going to start at the back, and I'm not going to read all of your chats because there's too many of them, I think, and I don't want to take that much time. But <laughs> yes, Brenda, art and philosophy, <clears throat> maybe all in one. <laughs> I hope I hope it's entertaining and, and I hope it's maybe in, instructive to some degree. Anyway, um, there I'm in the picture. Yeah, nice shot of my messy studio back there. Just ignore that. I'm an interesting guy. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. You're an interesting gal. <laughs> I know this. Congratulations on. No, you're not winning. You didn't win something. I saw your one of your recent paintings. It was great. Forgive me. And you're the head of something. You're the the leader. You're the big cheese or something, Barbara. I was quite impressed. <laughs> Forgive me for being, being flippant with you. <laughs> it wasn't big cheese, but it was you're in charge of something. An artist organization up there in Ohio. Way to go. I'm very honored that you bought one of my paintings. I didn't know you were such a big, big wig when you bought it. Thank you. Very honored. Um, we talked about 3D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would might be fun. We'll see. I'll think about that. <laughs> uh, David, <laughs> you guys do understand he's all alone, right? Talking to himself. <laughs> yeah, in a sense, but I'm also talking to you guys. So I, I'll tell people all the time when I when I'm out on the street painting and I'm broadcasting, you know, and I'm there standing in front of my painting, jabbering away. I say, I tell people. I just set this stuff up so it looks like I'm broadcasting. I'm actually I'm actually schizophrenic. <laughs> And I just put this stuff up there to disguise that fact. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is all acrylics. <laughs> um, <laughs> Six thirty in the morning, Brenda. Bless your heart. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, you're right, Susan. Sodom Gomorrah, another story. They didn't serve them. The lot pulled them in his house. Right. Anyway, good for you. Yeah, more of that. I, it's, uh, light blue says you need to change up the wings. D don't just have them all painted the same. Well, that's a good point. That is a really good point. Too late. <laughs> no. Well, I'll think about it. I'll seriously. Give. Yeah, because they're all they all have wings up. Um, cause clearly, I'm not thinking, and I'm, that's not a good defense. Just clearly, I'm not thinking of them as flying, like flapping these wings. These are descending wings. I'm not excusing myself. You make a really good point, but that is what I was thinking. I wasn't, I wasn't picturing these angels flying down. Maybe I should have. Maybe I should have. That probably was a good point, but. Yes, I'm cutting paint on canvas. That is scary. Oh, I backed up, didn't I? Oh, 
Oh, and David made a comment about Thomas Kincaid, many sources of light. That's exactly right. That is exactly, does, that is exactly right. All right, I'm going to let it go with that. You guys said a lot more stuff. I'll read it later when I have time. I think, I think I should end this broadcast here. Yeah, I will. I'll end it. And if I decide to broadcast again later this evening, I, I will do that. Uh, I might not, because my wife will be home soon. We've seen each other precious little for the last couple of days. And uh, we might go up for supper to try to rectify that a little bit. Isn't that sweet? Married 40 years, still like each other. I'm liking the painting. I, I, the shepherds and the sheep have been bothering me for weeks, so I'm glad I, glad I nailed that. Glad I got that done. You're at an extreme angle there, but yeah, I'll move you real quickly. Um, so there's there's the shepherds. They're loose, and and I like that. But the, the anatomy's not too bad, you know. Actually, you know what I just noticed? The sheep are too small compared to the the, shep, the sheep should really be about this big. Darn it. Okay, these are all lambs. <laughs> or the shepherds are all seven and a half feet tall. <laughs> Take your pick. <laughs> but I, I don't think I'm going to change that. Hopefully I'm the only person who will notice that. These are all lambs. The guys with the big sheep, they stayed back in a different pasture. These are leading lambs to slaughter. <laughs> leading lambs to Jesus. There. Oh, that's sweet. Isn't that sweet? There we go. I just resolved it. They're leading their lambs to Jesus. The Lamb of God. There we go. <laughs> I dodged that bullet, didn't I? All right, you guys, been fun. I've been crazy. Thanks for thanks for hanging out. Love you guys. Bye.